Father, we come to thy presence with the attitude of gratitude, Lord, for keeping us safe and sound and uh, giving us another opportunity, Lord, that we could come together to study your word. Lord, this moment we remember the people who have lost their lives in the, the accident that took place in Uttarakhand, Lord. Uh, it's so unfortunate that uh, we could not find, uh, we could not trace their bodies anymore or we could not find them anymore. It's such a great loss for their families. Lord, we, we pray that your peace may reign in the hearts of the bereaved families and uh, your pr presence and provision may be with them, Lord. And they may be able to find the required help from the people around and even from the government. And everybody may come forward to help them out. And especially, we need the, they need your help, oh Lord. And uh, provide them, provide them, protect them, and lead them into your light. Lord, as we are going to spend some time in meditating your word, we ask for your leading and guidance. And through everything we discuss, Lord, we may be mutually uh, edify, uh, edify and equip ourselves and may bring glory to your name by reflecting your love and life through us. Thank you very much for listening to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Praveen. It's uh, good that even though we don't know uh, those people yet, it's uh, as Christians, as disciples of Jesus, it's good to remember them because they are you know, loved by God. And of course, their eternal fate is in God's hands. So, today we are going to complete our section on the study of the church. I think we have uh, done it for over two or three, um, you know, uh, Wednesdays, but uh, we had lots to discuss. And I think it was uh, definitely a very helpful discussion. Uh, I have three questions left in the booklet to read and discuss. So we will uh, finish this and then get into the discussion. I'm not sure if we can utilize all our time, but we will do the best we can. I do also have some questions, which I'm sure will uh, spur some uh, discussion or comments from, from, from you. Okay, having said that, we'll straight away go to reading question number 13, and uh, it will be on your screen in a moment. Question number 13 reads the following. It says, how are the church on earth and the church in heaven joined? Okay, so you remember, <laughs> uh, even as we began our study, we, we uh, you know, discussed or rather we were wondering what is this church in heaven? Uh, so the question is, how are the church on earth and church in heaven joined? Uh, just a thought about that. Uh, uh, you know, in question number one, it had said, it is the whole community of faithful Christians in heaven and on earth who are incorporated into Jesus Christ. So uh, just to remind you that uh, we started that particular thought about the church in heaven, even back uh, when we uh, discussed the very first question. So let me read, go ahead and read uh, answer 13. And then uh, I'm going to read a, you know, a, a couple of scriptures so that we bring it into context. The answer in uh, the question that we read in 13 reads, the worship of the church on earth is a participation in the eternal worship of the church in heaven. One day we will be able to experience this unity. We, when we worship here on earth, we are joining in with the eternal worship that is already and forever taking place. All right. So uh, just an interesting thought. Once again, uh, the, uh, the, you know, what is mentioned there is definitely mysterious. It's, it's, it's beyond our full comprehension. What is this church in, uh, uh, in, uh, in heaven? Obviously, when we talk about church, it means... Uh, a gathering, uh, you know, a fellowship of people, a communion of people. Uh, that is what we must always keep in mind. It's uh, gathering together. But 
I'd like to read from Hebrews chapter 12, just to uh, bring in this thought, which once again, I don't think we can fully comprehend the, uh, the details of it, but it's a very interesting concept to keep in mind that someday there is going to be this unity, as is mentioned, between the church in heaven and the church on earth. Hebrews chapter 12, reading in verse 22, it says, Instead, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to myriads of angels, a festive gathering. Now, this is how it is rendered in the New International Version. Verse 23, to the assembly of the firstborn, whose names have been written in heaven, to a judge who is God of all, to the spirits of righteous people made perfect. Okay, I'll stop there. But uh, it uh, gives a very interesting scenario there. Talks about the myriads of angels. And so it seems like this, this gathering, this festive gathering, includes, you know, the hosts of heaven. I mean, uh, we don't know what words to use. We use angels, we use archangels, we use, uh, you know, elders. Uh, that is also mentioned. Let me read also in Revelation, just to bring this picture of a heavenly church. Uh, in Revelation chapter 7, let me quickly go there. Um, Revelation chapter 7, and I'll pick up uh, and read verses 11 and 12. Uh, notice how it reads in, uh, uh, in the New International Version. All the angels stood around the throne. And along with the elders and the four living creatures, they fell face down before the throne and worshipped God. All right. Saying, verse 12, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. So, uh, uh, fantastic uh, scenario there, you know, where the angels along with these so-called elders uh, and four living creatures. I mean, these are all, of course, uh, Revelation we know is uh, what they call is uh, apocalyptic uh, literature. Uh, they could be symbolic. I mean, highly symbolic. A lot of it is symbolic. Is there a literalism to it? Once again, uh, we are yet to fully comprehend and understand that. I'd like to read one more from the book of Revelation. And this is Revelation chapter 5, uh, reading in verse 13. Revelation 5 and verse 13. It says, I heard every creature in heaven, on earth, under the earth, on the sea, and everything in them say, blessing and honor and glory and power be to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Obviously, uh, that particular verse is describing that all of creation, it talks about heaven, earth, and under the earth. I mean, it's basically uh, comprehensively including the entire creation will, you know, be in a, you know, a worshipful posture before God, before the Lamb of God. Uh, and it's, you know, done, of course, forever and ever, which is uh, beyond the dimensions of time. Now, we read about angels, elders, you know, living creatures, uh, all of this. Could they form the church? I mean, the, the church in heaven. And my question is, what about those on earth who have died? Uh, there is the eternal, <laughs> you know, a question that we have always uh, discussed about, well, what happens to those who have died? Are they alive? Are they conscious? Uh, are they in heaven? Because the typical evangelical Christian, you know, perspective is that may, they have gone to heaven. They have gone to the heavenly abode. What does that mean? Obviously, uh, that, of course, is a study that uh, we don't have to do now. Maybe we should get into it some, some other time. But... Uh, once again, uh, what about the dead? We, have, we, we, we read in the scriptures that 
though the body you know returns to the dust uh, the spirit is received by god so these are all uh, such you know uh, concepts realities that is beyond uh, the human uh, you know capacity to fully recognize and understand so uh, but let me go back to the answer and uh, once again whatever this church in heaven is notice one interesting thing that uh, uh, that maybe we need to know the worship of the church on earth is a participation right in the eternal worship of you know the of god which is in uh, you know church in heaven and god almighty so uh, it also says we worship here on earth when we worship here on earth we are joining in with the eternal worship so that's an interesting thought you know you know every time we get together and worship every time we get together and when we talk about worship now remember uh, we are talking about worship in a very limited sense worship has you know multiple it, it can have an expanded meaning when we talk about worship it's a gathering together uh, singing and uh, you know literally worshiping god in 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 the in the way we understand uh, it, from the church's perspective all right worship can be of course beyond that uh you know even the way we conduct our lives can be an aspect of worship so i'm not getting into that but you may need to spare a thought that every time we get together you know we are joining and uh, we are participating with the hosts of heaven in the worship of god i think that's a profound you know perspective as as far as i'm concerned uh the fact that i'm joining the angelic hosts you know in worshiping god Uh, i think is, uh, is is a tremendous impetus for me to want to come together we are not only joining with one another we are joining the eternal heavenly hosts to worship father son holy spirit i mean uh, that's that's a profound thought and of course one day uh, we will experience to experience it in the unity of the spirit with the entire creation like it says in revelation 5 all of creation you know all of creation heaven earth under the earth all of creation will worship god so anyway so that is uh, what i'd like to leave you with maybe it's a for me it's an encouraging thought that when we come together we are actually joining not just uh, merely human beings but we are actually in the company of uh, a, the spiritual realm Uh, i think which is a uh, which is a tremendous thought okay having mentioned that let's move to question number 14 now question 14 the question reads how do christians enter into communion with christ and with one another all right so the question is how do christians enter into communion with christ and with one another obviously this don't forget we are discussing church so all of these are uh, connected to our understanding about church now the answer go ahead uh, you know reads as follows by the ministry of the holy spirit working through word and sacrament because the spirit uses these means to bring about his saving purposes the word of god and the sacraments are called means of grace we practice two sacraments baptism and the lord's supper because these were instituted for the church by jesus christ all right so uh we are talking about communion uh how is it that we are we have the or what is this communion that we have and how is it made possible so when we come together as disciples of jesus as christians there is a special communion that exists it goes beyond uh, the typical earthly you know get togethers that we can talk about i think our communion our get together our assembly has 
uh, not just a physical connotation, it moves into the spiritual realm. So um, notice uh, it says, by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And once again, I have said this many a times before, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is a very important ministry. Today, the ministry of the Holy Spirit continues to, you know, uh, uh, continues to take place. And the, and the Spirit, though unseen to us, is accomplishing the life of Jesus in all of us in so many different ways. And one of the ways is bringing us into communion, right? And notice it says, the ministry of the Holy Spirit working through word, and I understand word here as Jesus Christ, because he is the living word of God. We also have the written word of God, which is the scriptures. But I, I would understand this as Jesus Christ, because it's in Christ that we have that sense of union. Uh, he, you know, initiated that union and accomplished it in his incarnation. So it is done through Christ and the sacraments. Of course, we have discussed the sacraments in another study sometime back. We can also call it ordinances and be specifically focused on baptism and Lord's Supper. Now, the question is, why is this baptism and Lord's Supper mentioned? Why are these ordinances or uh, uh, you know, sacraments mentioned? When we talk about baptism, we are talking about an immersion. And where are we, be, we being immersed? We are being immersed in the body of Christ. So a communion already begins to take place there, right? Uh, now, Christ has already accomplished that immersion, that union. But we acknowledge that with our own baptism, if we have opportunity to do that. So uh, the baptism represents a a special type of union and communion that is taking place through the immersion in the body of Christ. What about the Lord's Supper? The Lord's Supper is partaking of the body of Christ. Once again, a special uh, type of union taking place there as we allow Christ, uh, as we invite Christ, as we, uh, I mean, not that, you know, Christ is not already in us, uh, but we acknowledge the presence of Christ in our lives. So that is the reason why baptism and Lord's Supper is mentioned. This is the uh, representation of the union that we are talking about. So when it reads, when the question reads, how do Christians enter into communion with Christ and with one another? Well, this is how it is taking place. And this communion, like I said, is a, a, a very special union. So what is the significance of this? How does, uh, what, what, what uh, difference does it make for us to understand this? Um, this helps us to understand that whether we like it or not, we belong to the body. In other words, we are not individual Christian. We are not separated entities, separated from the body of Christ. We have already, you know, in the body of Christ. So the union we talk about is a reality that exists as we uh, remain in Christ. Okay. So I, I specifically mention this because some people don't like the church. They say, I like Jesus, but I don't like the church. I don't know if there is a, uh, there is some saying uh, which you, I don't know if you heard of it, but they say, I do Jesus, but I don't do church. <laughs> uh, it, it is, uh, what do you say? Is it, is it an oxymoron? I don't know if that's the right word to use, but it's a contradiction. You can't do Jesus without doing church because church is Jesus. <laughs> it's the body of Christ. So if you belong to Christ, you belong to the body. And so I think that is the significance I'd like to pick out of that. And, uh, and the whole concept of communion is something that, you know, is a, a reality that, uh, that, it, that, that is real, that is true, uh, whether we like it or not. 
Okay, uh, in this section, I just also want to uh, read uh, the, uh, the notes from Gary Dedo's uh, essay, which I did uh, read last time also. The essay is titled The Church and Its Ministry. And in uh, under the section, many members, one body, I just like to pick out uh, a few sentences from there just to bring uh, a, a greater clarity to it. Uh, he says the following, he says the primary dynamic of the life in the body of Christ is how there are many members yet one body. So right there we begin to understand when we are in Christ, we already have become part of the body, right? He goes on to say the fallen human tendency is to want to go our own way and thus undo the unity of the church. And that's, uh, you know, once again, uh, you know, that's a contradiction. Um, it goes on to say, for that unity to be regarded in such a way that the distinctions of the many is diminished. In other words, uh, we are united, though we are distinct, though we are uh, diverse, yet there is a unity, right? So our unity does not distinguish, or rather, I should say, extinguish. Our unity does not extinguish our diversity. It does not uh, extinguish our distinctions. We bring our distinctions and we bring a, uh, what is the word that we use uh, when we come together? There is a special English word, it just escaped my mind. But uh, uh, there is a, we bring that, uh, all those distinctions and it's like that, a uh, beautiful picture that begins to take place as the body of Jesus Christ, okay? So uh, uh, once again, just reiterating that sense of communion that we have with one another in the church. Let me just read a few more sentences. Though unity and diversity are often at odds with one another, in the body of Christ and by the spirit, they go together, all right? So that's the important thing. Uh, it looks like we are at odds, but no. The spirit stitches all of those together. It brings in all those distinctions into a beautiful, uh, you know, tapestry, you could say, uh, you know, bringing the fullness of the body of Christ, though distinct yet united. Um, so it, he, he says, it's not a mindless union, nor does it occur automatically, right? So the union that is uh, being accomplished in, in, in Christ by the Holy Spirit is not mindless, nor does it occur automatically. It has to be of the Spirit. We have to submit to the Spirit so that we are allowing that unity to uh, uh, bring forth fruit and uh, manifest, you know, that. Uh, oneness. And finally, uh, true unity with diversity is a miracle of the spirit of Jesus that must be purposefully received and thus shared. Right? So true unity within the diversity is a miracle of the spirit of Jesus. Once again, very clearly indicating it is not possible by just, you know, human effort. It is not possible by just human agreements or what, you know, it, it's done in the spirit. That's why we have to be in Christ to experience this sense of unity. Uh, I'll conclude by saying out of the center of our relationship with Christ arises our relationship with one another. And so we have this one another situation coming in. It is only in our uh, in, in the center of our relationship with Christ, that the relationship with one another then begins to make meaning. Even though we are diverse, there is uh, some, you know, uh, powerful unity that we experience as the body of Jesus Christ. Okay, I think I'll leave uh, that question there. And we will go now to the last question in our uh, uh, in the booklet. Question number 15 reads, 
Why should Christians gather for worship? Once again, the question comes back to this concept of worship, which is very much part of the life of the church. And we are discussing church and hence uh, the importance of worship. And once again, I want to clarify the word worship here is limited to our gathering together and doing things together. It does not include the other aspects of, uh, you know, worshiping God in, you know, various ways and different ways. It's not just through gathering together. And anyway, let me read the answer. As members of the body of Christ, we gather for worship to honor God with thanks and praise to receive the sacraments and to hear God's word proclaimed so that the gospel may be in our hearts and put into practice in our lives. Through these encounters with God in worship, we are reminded of God's nature and character and we grow in faith, hope and love for him. This prepares us to go out from worship to make God known in word and deed. We typically hold our primary worship gathering on the first day of the week in celebration of the fulfillment of God's promise to be our rest through uh, our Lord's resurrection. Okay, uh, <clears throat> now I just want to sort of uh, condense that uh, you know, into just one, one basic concept. If you notice the answer talks about, you know, we worship, the question is why should Christians gather for worship? So we worship to receive from God. Uh, and it is also then to be able to go out into the world and be a witness for Christ. The way I'd like to just uh, sort of, uh, you know, condense it is there is a receiving when we are worshiping corporately as a body of Christ, wherever we are, wherever we are able to gather, there is a receiving, a receiving from God. And as it says, through the sacraments, uh, through the word being preached, uh, you know, so there is a, a receiving taking place, but there is also a response that is taking place, right? Um, there is a response of thanksgiving. There is a response of acknowledging and praising God. Uh, so there is a receiving, there is a response, which then empowers us, equips us to be witnesses, even as we leave uh, the premises or the gathering, we go back empowered to become a witness. But the interesting thing I'd like to just pick out from there is this receiving, this response is what? It's powerfully indicative of a relationship, right? Um, uh, it's a relationship that we are celebrating. Uh, so the worship is, of course, in the corporate sense, is uh, we are actually showcasing, manifesting, we are experiencing that relationship that we have with Christ and with one another. Being in Christ, we have that relationship with one another. So, um, uh, uh, if I can even more condense it, you know, you remember uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I won't turn there, but you, in, 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 you remember it says, in view of God's mercies, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice, right? It's uh, uh, some people can bring in an aspect of worship there. But what is interesting there is in view of God's mercies, in other words, that can be representative of his love. In view of God's love. Who is this God that we are worshiping? He's a God of love, right? So worship is to receive God's love, uh, to then respond to love God, and the response then uh, extends to fellow brethren to love one another. So the whole concept of worship is tied in so powerfully and strongly in love and expressed in a relationship of praise and thanksgiving and receiving and responding. And so worship then is that very dynamic process uh, of a relationship that is functioning 
with, uh, you know, with uh, great dynamism. So um, that is what I would like to just mention. When they say, why should Christians gather for worship? Uh, there's many, much more we can say, but I'd like to just focus it on the fact that when we say, why should Christians work or gather for worship? We must also ask the question, who are we worshiping? The who question constantly keeps, uh, you know, should be staring us in the face. And when we say who, it is a God of love. And this is the God of love who gives himself to us. And then he is inviting us into a relationship. And so we are celebrating that, uh, the giving, the whole giving and receiving aspect of uh, this dynamic relationship. Now, the answer ends by talking about, you know, we, and that is uh, talking about GCI. Uh, our policy is that our primary worship is gathering on the first day of the week in celebration of the fulfillment of God's promise to be our rest through our Lord's resurrection. I may just want to mention that is that has nothing to do with a debate on Sabbath keeping. Uh, we are not discussing that at all. So I don't want you to go off into thinking, oh, you know what, you know, uh, you know are we, uh, have we changed the Sabbath from seventh day to first day? <laughs> uh, we don't want to get into that discussion. Uh, we are not talking about any changing of any days. We are just saying our policy is to meet on the first day of the week. And of course, it, it, it connects to the Lord's resurrection and that could I open another can of worms. Did the Lord resurrect on first day of the week or the seventh day of the week? And oh my, you can keep discussing that till the cows come home, like we say here in India. Uh, I don't know if you have that saying in the in, in the US, Anil, but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so we won't get into that. So that's just a policy statement that we do encourage worship, corporate worship, and we recognize it as entering the rest that we have in Jesus, not entering a rest of a day, but a rest that is available in a person and that is Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Uh, actually, we did good time. I thought uh, we might finish earlier, but open, the floor is now open for uh, questions, comments. Please go ahead. If you are, if the, the wheels in your head are still turning, uh, you know, maybe I'll throw in a question or two and you can also consider that as we discuss. There are, there are people who ask these questions. Can I worship alone? Right? And another question is, is it a sin not to worship? So, what do you think? Uh, are these relevant questions? Uh, can we, uh, you know, look at it from what the scripture would probably, in, uh, you know, indicate? Can I come in? Yes, Sheila, go ahead. Uh, see, people who live in remote areas, where there are no other brethren, they have uh, left with no choice but to worship alone, right? Uh, yes, <laughs> Ashila, I think. Unless they join some other church and, uh, you know, go along with them. Uh, do you yes. Uh, go ahead, Sheila. Finish your question. Yeah, I finished. I finished. This okay. My first <laughs> right. Yes, I think uh, uh, there is a particular reference uh, to your situation, right? You are basically alone in one sense. Uh, and uh, you probably have no opportunity to get to a church. Um, so yes, uh, the question is, uh, you, you know, you have no choice but worship alone. <laughs> yeah, you know, no, physically. I'm not referring only to myself. There are people who live in remote areas where there are no you know, other brethren from the same church. So what about them? I mean, them also, yeah. not only my mine is, of course, hopefully it's a temporary situation. Yes. But, uh, 
Yes, obviously, I think, uh, you know, I mean, your situation demands or forces you to uh, you know, do whatever you can in terms of, you know, some, some sense of worship that you would like to have. For us as Christians, we do want to have, you know, the taste of worship. But uh, thankfully, <laughs> it is sad to say this, but the pandemic, thankfully, you know, has connected us in this manner. So it's amazing that uh, we have now a new platform of worship. But frankly speaking, uh, I still feel this is just uh, uh, not the best. And I still feel that rubbing shoulders with one another, shaking hands, hugging one another is something that, uh, of course, uh, you know, is, is so very much necessary and important you know, in our relationship. Any, anybody else have a thought on that? I mean, uh, uh, any any anything you can say? Yes, Surya Murthy, go ahead. As you said, there are many ways to worship. So, coming together is another way of worshiping. Yes. 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 Well said, Surya Murthy. Uh, absolutely right. And I, when we talk about Sheila, we have to talk about you also. You are also in more or less uh, remote because you don't have a, you know, an opportunity to meet with us as, you know, GCI church. But thankfully, you know, if I can just mention that, uh, you know, our, uh, through our reformation, we, we have begun to understand that uh, church is not just an institution like the GCI or the Methodist or the Baptist. It is much larger than that. And in that respect, if you have opportunity to meet with others with like mind, obviously, uh, one has to be mm -hmm. careful what kind of uh, theology or biblical teaching or interpretation that is being disseminated. Uh, but that is an uh, that is a opportunity that we can take advantage of it is, if that is possible. Yes, Surimurti, go ahead. You were cautioning about the theology of other churches. There are numbers in those churches also. They may be believing in things which are wrong also. Yeah. Still, are they united with Christ? Yes. Uh, yeah, that's also, again, Maybe a fairly loaded question. <laughs> uh, one has to be very careful how you answer that. But uh, but we do know that uh, you know you can have uh, you know uh, a diversity in the peripheral you know as belief systems. Uh, but I believe that in the core essential beliefs of the Christian faith. There has to be some some kind of unity, uh, but otherwise, uh, our unity is in Christ. And if Christ is compromised, then where is the unity? You know. And so I believe that uh, you cannot compromise on Christ. Even like last time we spoke about, like you know, Praveen mentioned about if you believe that Christ is only a human and has not a divine being come in the flesh, then uh, there is a, a major problem with that and those kind of teachings and of course I remember Sheila asking me a question about this and I told her that it is prophesied there will be false teachers and false teaching and uh, we are cautioned not to imbibe of those that doesn't mean to say we condemn people we don't sir we do not condemn people each one are at different levels of understanding and they may grow and the Holy Spirit will guide them to understand the truth but uh, we, we must be careful that uh, what we may not necessarily accept. Like, for example, I mentioned a particular uh, denomination to Sheila. Uh, I wouldn't want to be part of them because they deny Jesus, Jesus' divinity. How can I be part of that organization that believes that Jesus is not God? And hence, you can't even worship Jesus. So I cannot, uh, in, in, in all you know, honesty and uh, true faith, I cannot belong to, uh, in an organization like that. I don't know if I'm making sense, but uh, feel, feel free to, to uh, comment. Yes, David, go ahead. Well, 
well uh, this always uh, discussion on mainline churches um, but uh, many mainline churches uh, uh, normally stick to certain form of doctrine or you know uh, uh, the way of worship and stuff like that because i've, I've experienced uh, baptists as a different uh, <laughs> Uh, a way of a uh, style of worship and stuff like that of course uh, uh, but apart from the pentecostals i'm not looking into that but but i'm talking about the baptists or the methodists uh, these are called the mainline churches and they are uh, to an extent uh, uh, available in some remote areas so uh, as a church when suppose i happen to go to a place where we don't have a connection uh, with uh, the gci so uh, which is the mainline church which you think which is kind of closer where we can be able to, uh, I mean, I'm just, <laughs> it's not a speculation, but I'm just inquisitive to know about this. Yeah, right. yeah. your question is, uh, which is closer, but closer to what, David? <laughs> closer to the teachings of the Lord. I mean, th th there's always uh, uh, deviations in some, uh, you know, uh, there's a subtle deviation in certain uh, teachings. So uh, it would be good at least, you know, uh, because uh, mainline churches are very influential in that sense, yeah. because ma many tend to go because uh, they see the crowd or whatever the, could be the reason. Uh, but normally uh, uh, people don't have that intuition to, uh, you know, give reverence to the word. So they just get into uh, the crowd kind of. So I'm not talking about the club, club churches like Satish Kumar and all. These are all club churches. But I'm talking about a structured church um, like uh, maybe Baptist or Methodist or Wesley. And these are some orthodox uh, mainline churches. So um, uh, I, I'm just trying to figure out just in case. I mean, in, in case if I happen to, you know, because things can change. I mean, uh, I, we may be relocated for whatever reason. So uh, that's where uh, I'm just coming from. I hope I would be able to pass on my message. And, yeah. uh, well, David, I think, uh, I think it may not be wise for us to classify a church, one church closer to the truth and one church not closer. Okay. Uh, uh, maybe it, it, it probably wiser not to mention any names there. I presume I can only uh, guide you to the fact that you must go and experience it. And if you find that their preaching and teaching, uh, you know, is what you have been, you have understood the scriptures to be, I think uh, it, it depends on you whether you're going to be comfortable there. If it isn't, are you going to be comfortable, uh, you know, uh, worshiping with them? So, so I would just leave it there. Uh, I, 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 I prefer not to mention any particular denomination being either closer or, or not closer, you know, to the truth. Uh, say, say that again, Bertram. Discretion, discretion. Okay. Dis discretion. Yes, Banas yes, understood. Discretion. Understood, yes. yes. If we're really keen, then I think the Holy Spirit will direct our path. And uh, that would help us because all churches have some problem, but, but we iron sharpens iron and we have to meet people in the long run. Yeah, I think that's a good comment, uh, Reka, because uh, you once again mentioned the Holy Spirit and then the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is vital. And I think we must recognize it and uh, allow the Holy Spirit to lead us. And like you said, who knows, uh, we could be a catalyst for change. Uh, in yes, you know, yeah. in wherever we go. So, I don't know if uh, Praveen, you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I personally would look at this subject in this perspective. Uh, there are no perfect churches, and there are, we already studied about it. And every church is unique and blessed in a unique, uh, unique way. Uh, there is no denomination which is absolutely correct, though there is no other denomination which is uh, totally bad. And if you are looking somebody who is close, correct, correct and all, we, that's, that is where we are idealizing ourselves, number one. 
Uh, we are idealizing ourselves, number one. And number two, we are not seeking Christ. We'll be seeking another ourselves. You know, in other words, we will not be seeking Jesus, but we'll be seeking GCI. Uh, gee, I guess here we are worshipping Jesus, not GCI. That we need to keep in our mind, number one. And number two is, uh, see, as I said, every church is unique and that depends on the people who are there. They have some goods and they have some weaknesses. All those things are there. Instead of looking, trying to look uh, for something that aligns with us, why don't we look in this direction? Uh, you know, my presence there may bring change in the church. This is like when we go, there is a church where there is a problem with administration. For example, you are good at administration. You, you join them. Your presence, maybe God, God also can be maybe leading you there. There, your presence may bring changes. So some may, may, may not be very good in teaching. And you are good in teaching. You go there and your presence may make change. And if the change is happening, people are open, well and good. It would be a good experience. If they are not open, as Jesus said, shake the dust off your shoes and go to another place. Okay. So it is not right uh, for a Christian, I believe, to think uh, uh, this uh, this denomination is correct for me. I This suits for this church suits me. Other church doesn't suit me. Maybe better way to question the, this is, how do I suit them? How am I going to be helpful to them? How am I going to fit in there to make it even better? So perhaps as Christians, we should be thinking that way because the quality of the church and direction of the church or whatever the church focuses, it will be based on the people who are attending. So when people like you, like like-minded, are coming together, they will be having a direction. So maybe you are going to make an influence there. You are going to take the church in a direction. What you are thinking, we don't know what happens. You know, God, God can work miracles. Uh, you know, Charles Spurgeon also did the same. Methodist John Wesley, he he did not start a new church. He was teaching in in Anglican church, and he brought it. <coughs> New <coughs> he brought a new revolution, revolution into the church. So better question may not be what is the right church. Better question may be how can I fit into the church so that the church can be benefited. I think there's a, a, a very good point, sir. Especially over the fact that, you know, remember we worship Jesus, not a particular denomination or a church. And... Uh, being right, you know, the right fit. If you are the right fit, then, you know, maybe God wants you to be there. So, Any other thoughts or questions, comments? We have uh, maybe two or three minutes left. Yes, Bertie, go ahead. Uh, would you unmute yourself, Bertie? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, 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 we should uh, always remember and keep it in the forefront that it is the Holy Spirit that uh, draws us and uh, works in us. The Holy Spirit's ministry puts us in a uh, Bertie, we are unable to hear you. Your voice is uh, getting cut. So... Can you switch off your video and from a church or in? <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah, try now. Yes. I'm saying we should always put in a, uh, put uh, put it in the forefront. Always remind ourselves that it is the Holy Spirit in the first place that puts us into the body of Christ and places us in the church, or even removes us from the church. So that way we are more safer. And of course, uh, look up like the Berians, look up uh, in the scriptures whether what they teach is the truth, uh, truth of God, and it, whether, it's, uh, uh, whether we are agreeing to the word of God and is in agreement to the word of God. It is the Holy Spirit that is working in and through us and uh, in, in, in wonderful ways. Okay. Okay. Once again, you highlight the ministry of the Holy Spirit, which I think yes, yes. is significant. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Bertie.
Okay, I think uh, we have done well for today. And uh, thank you once again very much for uh, joining us uh, for the study. And I hope that we continue to learn from one another and uh, spur one another to you know, greater understanding. So let's close in prayer. And if I can request David, would you please lead us in a closing prayer, David? Thank you. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you, Lord, uh, for this wonderful uh, fellowship and this wonderful Bible teaching, Lord. Yes, Lord, there's lots to know. We are uh, progressive in learning. And the beautiful uh, gift of the church, which is uh, uh, your body, Lord, you are the head for us. And uh, we have united. And there's so much to know, Lord. It's a vast subject. Father, Lord, Help us to open our hearts and minds that the Holy Spirit will uh, lead us into uh, your truth and guide us in the days to come. We, we, we ask you, Lord, that you will bless each one of us, that you will give us a listening ear and a willing heart to be able to learn uh, in humility and, and, and get the glory to you, Father Lord. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you again. Have a good rest of the day. God bless you.